Uh, good afternoon. Uh, take a seat, please. Uh, uh, welcome to the Chan Award winner uh, uh, laudation, uh, uh, lo uh, Chan uh, laudation lecture for Chan Award winner, Professor Philip Griffiths. Uh, it is my uh, great honor to introduce the speaker, uh, Professor Mark Green from UCLA. He will highlight the work of Professor Griffiths. Let us welcome him. So, the few times I've come to an ICM, I always get the feeling, you know, this is how the world should be. All of us together, uh, learning from each other and working together. I'm particularly honored to be part of this ICM, which it's clear on several metrics is a historic one. I'm really honored to be associated with the name of Professor Chur, and this is a picture I found of him from the Harvard website. It's one of the people I admire most, and of course, I'm really thrilled to be talking about the work of Professor Griffiths, Philip, who is, I've shared friendship and mathematics with for over 40 years. So I can't do Ingrid's maneuver and spin this around, but this is the Turin medal. You can see both sides. I think it's the Gauss-Binet theorem. The, um, it's, there are two things you have to do to win it, to do um, wonderful mathematics and to be alive. I encourage you all to maintain your eligibility as long as possible. This is Philip. I found this picture on the web. I like it because it really reflects his kindness and wisdom. So a little bit about Philip. So he was born in North Carolina, and he was an undergraduate at Wake Forest University. An interesting fact is that he had a basketball scholarship there. Um, American system is very interesting. Um, Princeton recognized his talent. He went there for graduate school and worked with Donald Spencer. Um, Kadira and Spencer had recently at that point developed deformation theory of complex manifolds, how you get the tangent space to the family of complex manifolds of given type. And you'll see that this was a crucial ingredient in the way Philip looked at the world. He then had the good fortune to work with Professor Churn, who was a very deep influence on his work. He held faculty and administrative positions at some of the absolutely greatest institutions in the United States. So he's celebrated for his students. There are many of his students who are quite distinguished mathematicians in their own right. Um, this is the number of descendants he had when I checked earlier on math genealogy. There are probably more now. Um, I mean, it's staggering. If you think if all of them were here, you know, they would fill a couple of sections of this. Actually, I hope they are all here. Um, now, just for comparison, Truman has 913 descendants. This is the gold standard. So his other offspring, um, as you can see, no expense was spared to take this high-quality photograph. The um, brown areas you see are the floor of our dining room. The, in the middle, you can see a volume that Philip edited about from one of the Truman conferences. You also will see up there, Principles of Algebraic Geometry. I have two copies, one for office, one for home. This is the one, actually, that looks better. This is a book that really gets used. So I'm just going to briefly touch on his activities in the developing world, which I think you heard about some earlier. He was founding chairman of the Science Initiative Group. He is involved with the Millennium Science Initiative with the Regional Initiative in Science and Education, and to come to the bottom line, 
The initiatives he's been involved with have benefited thousands of scientists, strengthened institutions, and bolstered national research systems. I sometimes tell young people that Philip is a good role model, but you shouldn't try to do everything he does. So this is a sampling, a kind of um, greatest hits, in my opinion, of some of Philip's work. This is what would fit on one slide. I want to emphasize the bottom line that this list will continue to grow. So my strategy, this is not a talk for experts, my strategy is to take this first um, achievement, which is the only one you'll notice that where he does not have a co-author. Most of these co-authors are his students or other people he's worked closely with for a long period. That'll be a kind of um, march into the heart of transcendental algebraic geometry. And um, then I'm going to try to say a little bit about some of this work on isometric embeddings, which has a completely different flavor. So this was when I was very optimistic. The Hyde theory will take up more than that. I'll have maybe the last 10 minutes or so for the exterior differential system stuff. And in Hyde's theory, there are two main things. One is going to be how Hyde structures vary in families, and one will then be this homological equivalence versus algebraic equivalence. And I intend to get to um, explain from the very beginning. So it'll be a, as I say, a, a march into the heart of transcendental algebraic geometry, but um, we have to move reasonably quickly to get there. So I don't know who picked this name for our field. It's a great piece of marketing. Um, it's a wonderful word, transcendental. I sometimes picture, you know, the celestial realm, but with, so you'll see um, the cubic surface with its famous 27 lines here. Uh, I think that's a Kummer surface over there. These are from the Institut Henri Poincaré. Um, unfortunately, we of course have to share paradise with the transcendental number theorists, but, more seriously, so you have a typical transcendental number like, function like inverse sine of x. Its derivative is algebraic. When you teach calculus, this is very unfortunate because your students have this simple thing to integrate and it gets complicated to have an answer. But for us, it's great because you have this complicated thing and you can differentiate it and it becomes simple. And that will come in at a later stage of the discussion. So, I, in my time learning from Chern, this is really a direct quote. Um, you can see that the differential geometers took this advice more to heart than the algebraic geometers. So I want to start in, so you need the complex numbers to study transcendental functions, as you know from power series. And so I'm going to start with compact connected Riemann surfaces as motivation. It's interesting that of the four Fields medalists that in Professor Mirzakhani's work, she used, of course, these surfaces over C, and in Professor Bagava's work, he uses their incarnation as algebraic curves, and I'll talk about that uh, connection a little bit later. So these, by the maximum principle, there are no global analytic functions on these except constants, but they do have global meromorphic functions. And so, if you have a meromorphic function locally, you, at p, you can always pull out some factor of z minus p. It may be one over z minus p squared if you have a double pole. It might be z minus p cubed if you have a triple zero, times a function that locally is holomorphic and non-zero at p. You could also just get this by taking the residue at p. And if you, take a formal finite sum here of these um, order of vanishing or poles times the point, this is called the divisor of F. So it's a formal sum like zero chains and topology, two of these are equal if the coefficients of every point are the same. So this is of course an infinite dimensional space. And the degree is just you add up the coefficients, so a you Take a double pole as minus two, plus a triple zero, et cetera. You get a number. And the um, 
first theorem about these is that on a global meromorphic function on a compact Riemann surface, this degree is always zero. So counting zeros and poles, you have the same number of zeros and poles. So this is, if you've never thought about it, easy to see. We all learn in complex analysis, if you have a region R whose boundary doesn't go through a zero pole, if you integrate 1 over 2 pi i df over f around this, you get the number of zeros minus the number of poles. Now, if you just triangulate your surface, you'll see that each edge occurs twice with opposite direction. And so if you just apply this, the left-hand side will add up to zero. So that proves that. Now, a little notation. So C of M star is the global meromorphic functions on M except the one that's identically zero. That's, that function doesn't have a divisor. And div of M is the set of divisors. Div zero of M is the ones of degree zero. And so we have that C of M star maps by this div map to divisors of degree zero. So, as I mentioned, the kernel of this is just the non-zero constant. And on the sphere, this map is surjective. So we know this, this is that in most complex analysis courses, right, you have quotients of polynomials. Those don't look like if the degrees of P and Q are different, like the same number of zeros and poles, but the point at infinity takes care of that. So, if you have a complex torus, so this is C modulo a lattice, so like the set of all M plus N lambda, where M and N are integers, and lambda is not real, then you get a complex torus. It looks like a surface of genus one. Now, um, in Professor Bargava's talk, to him these are given by an equation like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. A and b are transcendental functions of lambda, so we've moved up to a different, different level where certain things are harder and certain things are easier. Um, I emphasize that as lambda changes, these are not the same as complex manifolds, not the same as Riemann surfaces. There's not a biholomorphic map in general. And also that T is obviously a group. It's a group C modulo uh, a subgroup. And, um, so if you have P and Q and T, I'm going to denote temporarily with this circular plus sign there, sum in T. You can apply this then to divisors. If you have something of divisor to be zero, you can just take summation NPP and add up in the torus, counting multiplicity. And Abel's theorem is that when you do this, the divisor of F has this extra condition beyond being of degree zero, the points with multiplicity have to add up to zero in the torus. And in fact, then, the abel jacobi theorem says that divisors of degree zero surject onto T. That's rather easy here. And so you have a nice exact sequence. Again, this is not a difficult thing to prove if you just integrate ZDF over F around the fundamental parallelogram. You'll rapidly see that that equals the sum of NPP by the residue theorem, but you can actually compute it and see that what you get is a multiple, an element of the lattice. So if you go to source of genus G, there's no way to add points. So something I learned from Philip is that if you have a case you don't understand, you go back to the case you do understand and figure out that you really don't understand that case fully. And so if you go back to the torus, another way to do things is to take your divisor degree zero and write it as the boundary of a one chain. So make a series of curves going from the poles to the zeros. And then you can integrate, well, so that's, and then you can integrate that dz along that path. And it's easy to see that's this thing we got by adding up the points in the torus. So modulo lambda, which if you change gamma by a cycle, you'll get elements of lambda here. That's what this is. And so this gives us an alternate construction of this map in Abel's theorem for the torus. So now 
The analog of DZ does exist. These are called abelian differentials or holomorphic one forms. It's a global object on your Riemann surface. You can write it as f of z dz locally in z, where f is an analytic function, but dz transforms like a differential, as in calculus. And the dimension of these is called the analytic genus, and a theorem which I'll discuss a bit later. This is the same as the usual topological genus, the number of handles or holes. So I'll write a basis of those, omega-1 to omega-g. And now you can do what we just did for the torus. If you have something to degree zero, it's the boundary of a one chain. You can integrate each of these guys over that one chain, and modulo lambda, which is what ha well, so modulo lambda, which is this, th it's well defined if you change gamma by adding a cycle to it. So the quotient of CG mod lambda is denoted J of M. This is called the Jacobian. It turns out again to be a complex torus, and the oval Jacobi map is defined by this procedure. And then, so the nice thing is that divisors of meromorphic functions satisfy Abel's theorem. They map to zero, but in fact, that's a sufficient condition. If you have degree zero and map to zero on the Abel Jacobi map, then it actually is a divisor of meromorphic function. That's the harder part of this theorem. And then lastly, this is map is surjective, which isn't hard. And so then you get that divisors of degree zero mod divisors of meromorphic functions is isomorphic to this complex torus. Okay, so now I need to um, step back and tell you a few things about Hodge theory. So um, Hodge, so if you have a smooth n-dimensional manifold, so remember this is just a nice topological space, locally it looks like Rn, x1 through xn will be local coordinates, they glue together in a C-infinity way, then we can introduce differentials dx1 through dxn, just as one would in calculus, except that we legislate we put in a new operation, this, denoted by this wedge, and we legislate it's anti-commutative. So when you switch the order, you put in a minus sign. And then a k-form is something which locally is a smooth function times a wedge of k of these dx's. And then there's this wonderful thing discovered by Poincaré and Cartan, the exterior derivative, which basically you just take what would be the ordinary calculus differential of fi1 through ik, and you wedge that with whatever is sitting over there. It looks like this depends on the choice of coordinates, but it's intrinsic. And then the miracle is that d squared is zero, basically because second partials commute, but we've made the dxi's not commute, and so everything cancels out. So if you have a topological k-chain on m, then it's well-defined to integrate a k form on M. The way these transform is exactly the change of variable formula for integration. And Stokes' theorem is that the integral of omega over the boundary of a k chain is the same as integrating d omega over the k chain. So this is, although it's called Stokes' theorem, it incorporates Green's theorem, divergence theorem, all the theorems of second year calculus. You can think of it as saying that d is dual to boundary. So now we can define Durham cohomology, which is just the closed k-forms mod the exact k-forms. So you sometimes see examples in calculus of vector fields that where the curl is zero, but it's not a gradient if you have a, some singularity in the midst. But we, this gets turned around because now we define something exactly based on those failures. And Durham's theorem is that this captures the traditional cohomology if you use real valued forms, it gives you the real cohomology, or complex if you use complex valued forms. So for a top, because of Stokes' theorem, you have a topological K cycle. If you integrate omega, it's independent of what choice of the Durham class you use. So Lebesgue theory tells you what can be integrated, but differential forms tell you where you can integrate things. 
So the Hodge theorem now, so the fact that you have a choice of de Ram representative, um, you might want to pick a unique one. And so Hodge realized you could do this if you add a little more structure. So M has to be oriented, which complex manifolds always are, and it has to be Ramanian manifold. So the tangent space at every point has to have a positive definite dot product, and that has to, that has to vary smoothly. So now if I let AK of M be these smooth K forms, then the exterior derivative has an adjoint that goes the other way from AK plus one of M, from K plus one forms to K forms. And then you can define the Laplacian D D star plus D star D, and that maps K forms to K forms. And then the harmonic K forms are just the kernel of this, which it's not hard to show, is the intersection of the kernel of D and the kernel of D star. It's also, these are the, in some sense, the shortest K forms in each de Ram class. Um, Hodge was inspired to do this by Maxwell's equation. So in relativity, electromagnetism is given by a two form and D omega equals zero and D star omega equals zero are Maxwell's equations in free space. So the Hodge theorem is that every de Ram class has a unique harmonic representative and this uses elliptic operator theory. So on a Riemann surface, to go back, the abelian differentials, they're conjugates. Well, the abelian differentials are harmonic and their conjugates are harmonic, and that's it. That's a basis for the harmonic forms. So here, we're going to introduce dz, which is a complex valued one form. It's dx plus i dy locally. dz bar is dx minus i dy locally. So these omega bars look like f bar of z bar dz bar. And the point here is that the harmonic one forms are spanned by differentials with either one dz or one dz bar. So if you have a complex manifold, so this is just a nice topological space, looks like Cn locally, your changes of holomorphic coordinates are analytic. And now, if you look at, uh, instead of using dx1, dy1, dx2, dy2, et cetera, you can use dz1, dz1 bar, dz2, dz2 bar as a basis for the differentials. And then you can define a form to have type PQ if P of the things which appear are dzi's and Q of the things that appear are dzi bars. And what you really would like is to be able to decompose the harmonic forms into a direct sum of PQ forms that are also harmonic. But the Laplacian does not respect PQ. And so unfortunately, even if you use the right kind of metric, Hermitian metric, it can't be done on an arbitrary compact complex manifold. However, there's this very nice special class, Kähler manifolds or Kähler metrics, where you do get that decomposition. So on a compact Kähler manifold, we have that the de Ram cohomology breaks up into direct sum P plus Q equals K, HPQ of M. And the harmonic forms depend on this metric, but the decomposition of cohomology doesn't. So CPN remembers the set of lines through the origin in CN plus one, and a closed complex submanifold of CPM is called the smooth projective variety. It's defined by algebraic equations automatically. And because CPN does have this Fubini study metric, which is a Kähler metric, all smooth complex, all smooth projective varieties inherit this metric. And so if you're an algebraic geometer, um, you don't have to worry about the case where there's no Hodge decomposition. So for smooth projective varieties, this always works. So this explained some discoveries that Lefschetz had made using geometric arguments. So for example, the fact that H1 of a Riemann surface is 2G two, is two dimensional, even dimension, he discovered that H1, H3, H5, all the odd dimensional cohomology groups are even dimensional. We'll, we'll come back to that. So now you see for compact Riemann surfaces, the Hodge decomposition looks like that. 
the H10 is the abelian differentials, H01 is the conjugates. So this explains why the analytic genus equals the topological genus. And when the dust settles, a nice way of writing the Jacobian, it's H10 of M modulo the first cohomology of M with integral coefficients. We'll see why we want that formulation in a little bit. So this is where things take a different turn. So um, to understand, it's one thing to understand one variety, but because of Philip's contact with Kadira Spencer's work, he looked at the question of what happens with families of smooth varieties. So you have some uh, complex manifold dimension one higher over some product of disks, which you view as the parameter space, and if this map P is analytic and its DP is surjective, then the XT, the preimages of T, are all smooth. And so it follows you can identify the cohomology groups of HK of the XTs in a natural way with each other, as long as you're over the polydisc. And so you can ask, how does the Hodge decomposition vary if you have this nice analytic family of smooth projective varieties? So the answer, it, well, the good news is that the dimension of the HPQs is constant. But the bad news is that the HPQs do not vary analytically. It's not holomorphic. So this is where Philip enters the picture. And he looked at, in the Hodge decomposition, all the things which had at least PDZs. So if it's HK, HK0, down through HP, K minus P. So this is a decreasing filtration on HK of M, which is what we've called the Hodge filtration. And um, this does vary holomorphically in a family. So immediately he took something that was really very, very basic bad thing that was happening and found a way to make it work by a real change of point of view. Now this map from M to the Hodge filtration then being holomorphic, it maps us to a parameter space. It's a nice Lie group homogeneous space. There's something called the Riemann-Hodge relations that I haven't mentioned. It gives you something called the period domain, which has a rich geometry and lots of interesting things. So the next thing he noticed, so I've written the Leibniz rule uh, here, but for um, a wedge of two one forms. So you can see if V has, a, has only DZs and W has only DZs, no matter what happens at the end, instead of two DZs, you have at least one DZ. You can only lose one of your DZs when you differentiate. So this simple fact turns out to say that if you have P disease, you can only lose one with the first derivative. So this became what's known as the infinitesimal period relation or Griffith's transversality, that the derivative of this space FP not only varies holomorphically, but it led to first order, it lands in FP minus one, the space one, uh, the next space up. So um, Chern never called Chern classes Turn classes. He always called them characteristic classes. Philip has never called this Griffith's transversality. Um, this gives you a set of one forms on the period domain, which has to vanish if you have a family of varieties. It does, so there's this nice condition, the Frobenius condition, for when you kind of get a nice foliation from these one forms. It doesn't satisfy this. Instead, it's something called an exterior differential system. And this is where Philip got interested in exterior differential systems. That's what this later part of the talk will be about. Okay, so we're getting close to the big problem that he solved. So now, if you have a smooth projective variety, a subset that's defined by algebraic equations is called an algebraic subvariety. These may not be smooth, they may have singularities, but despite that, with a little bit of algebra, you can define its dimension. And now the co-dimension of W is the difference. It turns out that's 
the best thing to look at is the difference between the dimension of this subvariety and the dimension of M. Now, we're now going to take finite formal linear combinations of subvarieties with integer coefficients. We saw this already with divisors. And so that's denoted ZP of M. And if you want to use rational coefficients, which we'll only do once, I'll put a Q there. So these are the codimension P algebraic cycles. If the default is integral coefficients, but otherwise rational coefficients. So if you have dimension of M equals N, the points always are algebraic, and so Zn of M is just the zero chains on M. So this is not such an exotic object, but of course it's tremendously infinite dimensional. So if you have such a thing, you can look at its cohomology class, because each of the Zis has dimension 2n minus 2p. You can look at its homology class. And then if you have a cycle, you just add up the homology classes. Now by Poincaré duality, h2n minus 2p, the homology is isomorphic to h2p, the cohomology with integer coefficients. So you can take the homology class and get a class A to Z in H2P of MZ, the Poincaré dual class. The reason to switch to cohomology, which, you know, for some of you may seem like a bad thing to do, is that you've got all this rich structure, particularly this PP, de this PQ decomposition that you then can apply. And so Hodge noticed that when you uh, change coefficients to C, and do the Hodge decomposition, that this A to Z always lands in the PP part. This is because back on the ZIs, the only way to have a form of top degree 2n minus 2p, well, is to have, um, wedge all the DZs and all the DZ bars together. There are only n, n minus p DZs and only n minus p DZ bars on there. So that's why you land there. So it's, in the image of the integral cohomology and HPP. And so, of course, the famous problem is if you do this, except you have to use rational coefficients, they're counterexamples otherwise, that this is a sufficient condition to come from an algebraic cycle. So again, if you didn't do cycles and you just did subvarieties, then you get into questions of what's called effectiveness. It, it's very difficult to do this, but this works. Uh, so there's no known. And of course, this is one of the million dollar problems. Someone, I forget who I was talking to, said, no, this is certainly one of the most difficult of the one million dollar problems. So, Philip, so there was an issue of how to define an intermediate Jacobian um, to play the role of Jacobian plays for curve, for Riemann surfaces. So Philip found this very nice definition you take the 2p minus first cohomology. So you remember, that has even dimension. And if you do the height, that's because HPQ and HQP are conjugate to each other. So if you mod out by all the things with at least p DZs, you've modded out by half of this space, and then you mod out by the lattice of integral stuff, it turns out you've got a torus. So for if you do this construction in, for codimension one, you get the Jacobian, just as we did for Riemann surfaces. Now, something I haven't mentioned until now, although it's quite crucial, is that what happens with the Jacobian of Riemann surfaces is this great piece of good fortune that it turns out, although you use a transcendental construction, that you land in the world of algebraic geometry. So this, in fact, is one, so not all complex tori can be realized as smooth projective varieties, but the Jacobian always can in, in a natural way. So if you look at J2 of M, for example, this is H03 plus H12 mod H3. It turns out that in general, starting with J2, this is not an abelian variety. So this, of course, initially might strike you as a terrible thing. But we'll see that, as often happens in mathematics, it 
terrible things turn out to be good things. So Griffiths proved that if you define the intermediate Jacobian this way, that again, if you have an analytic family of XTs, that these intermediate Jacobians vary holomorphically. Now, this was not the first major intermediate Jacobian construction. So Andre Vey, one of the unquestionably great mathematicians of the 20th century, had constructed an intermediate Jacobian that is an abelian variety. So, but it doesn't vary analytically in families. So Philip <coughs> told me the story, which I hope he won't mind my telling, that when he was uh, a young person, he was supposed to give a talk on Vey's construction, but unfortunately, whenever, when he was ready to prepare the talk, somehow he didn't have the paper available. And there's some very difficult signs in the construction of Vey's intermediate Jacobian. And so he said to himself, well, I can't just figure out these signs, but these have to vary analytically in a family, and so I'll see what signs you have for that to be true. And so as he put it to me, I got the signs wrong. So um, imagine to yourself, you're a young mathematician, and you got the signs wrong relative to a construction done by the greatest math one of the greatest mathematicians in the century you're living in. It takes a lot of guts to persist. <laughs> and that's what Philip did. So you'll see in a minute why this all works out really well. So I'm going to see how I'm doing the time. Oh, OK. Um, so now I want to define these three types of equivalence on cycles. So homological equivalence is easy. If the homology class is 0, that's what it means to be homologically equivalent to 0. Now there's another notion which is, it takes a little longer to understand. So if you have a compact connected Riemann surface C, you can look at a co-dimension P cycle on M cross C, which you can regard for each T and C as being a family of cycles on M parameterized by C. So you can get from the 1 over M cross P to the 1 over M cross Q by an algebraic family. So the way to picture this is, you have this cycle that's homologous to zero. You can fill in some geometric thing of which it's the boundary. But here you're asking to fill in a very special kind of thing. Namely, if you trace a, just a regular uh, one chain from P to Q and look at the pre-images, you get a very special thing of which this is the boundary. So if that happens, it's said to be algebraically equivalent to zero. And then you take the equivalence relation you get by taking sums of such things coming by that construction. If you insist not on using any compact Riemann surface, but it has to be the Riemann sphere, it has to, then it has to be of genus zero, you get what's called rational equivalence. And so it's progressively more restrictive to be, it's harder to be algebraically equivalent to zero than homologically, it's harder to be rationally than algebraically. So for Riemann surfaces, the cycles that are homologous to zero are just the divisors of degree zero, which is why I told you about them at the beginning. But likewise, because you can just use M as the curve in the definition of algebraic equivalence, it's also the same for algebraic equivalence. Rational equivalence turns out to be being a divisor for meromorphic function. So everything we saw before is just an instance of these equivalence relations. So note that in this case, algebraic equivalence and homological equivalence are the same. But a variety of people, Hodge and Bay and Grotendieck, probably Lefschetz, wondered if these two things were the same in general. That is, if you could fill in by some geometric, if something was a geometric boundary, could you fill in by this very special type of boundary? 
And the expectation was yes, because nobody could think of any possible way of telling apart those two equivalences. So this is where the uh, definition of the intermit Jacobian that Philip came up with begins to come in. So the obel jacobi map for M takes you from cycles homologous to zero to his intermediate Jacobian. You write Z as a boundary, and now you integrate uh, 2P minus 1 forms over that boundary, and it works as long as omega has at least P disease. I don't want to go into quite why that's the right thing, but it does. And furthermore, Griffith showed that things that are rationally equivalent to zero map to zero under this obel jacobi map, just as they did for Abel's theorem. Now, so you're getting a map from homological mod rational equivalence um, to um, the intermediate Jacobian. It's now known this is neither injective nor surjective once you get to codimension two or higher. However, if you unravel sort of the block balance and conjectures, the conjecture would be that you can reduce everything to the case where M is defined over Q bar, the closure of, the, of Q, and that then you're basically able to recover everything from this information. Okay, so now how does the Abel Jacobi relate to algebraic equivalence? So I want to go back to the definition of algebraic equivalence. You have a cycle in M cross C, and I'm going to pick a base point in C. And now ZT is going to be the preimage of T in this cycle, the element of this family. And so you get a map from C to the intermediate Jacobian by t sending T to the Abel Jacobi map of ZT minus Z at this base point. So ZT minus ZT zero is algebraically equivalent to zero by definition, and you can map into there. Now you also can map C to its Jacobian by mapping T to the Abel Jacobi map for C, just the regular Riemann surface one, of T minus T zero. And then it's a very easy universal property that the first map has to factor through the second map. It's just a map of complex tori, which is literally a linear map on the C's. Um, that this is some CG mod lambda, that's some other something mod lambda prime. It's just a linear map. Now, you remember I, I told you that J of C is an abelian variety and JP of M is not an abelian variety. That was supposed to be a bad thing, but you see what ends up happening is that the image of the cycles algebraically equivalent to zero have to land in the largest abelian variety. So it turns out there's a natural maximal abelian subvariety of JP of M, and the image of the Abel Jacobi map has to land in there, which you can see really from this because it factors through J of C. So now you have a map from the quotient of homo cycles homologous to zero mod cycles algebraically equivalent to zero to Griffith's Jacobian modulo its maximal abelian subthing. So this quotient over here now is called the Griffiths group. We need a couple more slides before we can call it that. Um, but you see now you have a way to potentially detect the difference between these two things. If you could find some cycle homologous to zero that mapped to something non-zero there. Okay, so the key tool here is something called normal functions. These go back to Poincaré and Lefschetz, and it's a very beautiful geometric idea. So, and I apologize, as I noticed there's one part of my thing which didn't come through. So this is supposed to be eta sub h. So you have v that's in CPN, and you have z that's a codimension p cycle in v. Now z is called primitive if it's homologous, if you intersect it with h, and then it's homologous to zero on v intersect h. So um, if it's primitive, then on z, z intersect h is homologous to zero on v intersect h, you can take its Abel Jacobi map to JP of V intersect H. 
So you therefore get this map called nu sub z, the normal function that takes you from the hyperplanes in CPN to the union of all of these intermediate Jacobians. And remember, these intermediate Jacobians, Philip had shown, they vary holomorphically in a family. So this is going to be something, a nice holomorphic object, and this will be a holomorphic map. So we're now going to pick a general line in this set of hyperplanes. In other words, we're going to take things in the form A1H1 plus A2H2 for two hyperplanes. And you can choose this so when it intersects B intersect H, you get mild singularities occasionally, but mostly it's smooth. And we can define intermediate Jacobian even for those. And so we get an analytic map from this sphere to the union of all of these intermediate Jacobians. And the theorem is that if you have something that's primitive uh, but not homologous to zero, it injects into the set of such maps. So the normal function detects whether a primitive cycle is homologous to zero or not. So now we come to the bottom line. So you start with a quintic fourfold in CP5. And you can choose one so that it's got some primitive cycles that aren't homologous to zero. And you can arrange that for almost all H, the intermediate Jacobian of V intersect H has no abelian part. Now, that sounds like it's very hard to compute because when you do it, you need to know, have some transcendental functions that you can evaluate. But the trick, and this is going back to Chern's advice, is that you only have to show if you have a non-zero one that when you perturb it a little bit, that the derivative makes it disappear. And so that's basically what Philip was able to do. He had all the machinery to do that. So now, if you choose such a z, then nu z of h is in the intermediate Jacobian and it can't be identically zero. It has to be non-zero on an open set. But if it landed in the abelian part of the intermediate Jacobian, since that's zero, it would have to map to zero. So therefore, when you do this, z intersect h for such an h, you can't say which h, but you know there's such h's. Although it's homologous to zero, it cannot be algebraically equivalent to zero. And so that's, that's the proof of this remarkable result. Now I feel that, well, as I said, the key idea is this transcendental to algebraic. I mean, there are many beautiful ideas you have to do to do these computations. I mean, at that point, Philip was creating a whole set of ways to compute things, very much inspired by work of Poincaré and Carton and Lefschetz and so forth and Hodge. So I feel, since you've followed me this far, that I should tell you about the referee's report for this piece of work. Um, I mean, probably all of us dream about doing something like this and imagine what the referee's report will look like. I thought you deserved to see it. So here it is. This is Stone Age mathematics. Do it in general. So. Um, there's a lesson here for young people, right? Don't get discouraged if your work is not appreciated. There's also a lesson here for referees, which I won't go into. Um, my own reaction is, if this is Stone Age mathematics, I'm going on a paleo diet. Now, if you're not from the United States, ask someone from California about this. A paleo diet basically means you eat the way we ate when we lived in caves. Um, all right, anyways. So, okay, great. So now I want to switch gears completely and just tell you a little bit about this work on isometric embedding. So this is with Robert Bryant and Dean Yang. So if you have a Romanian manifold, in local coordinates, you 
get this matrix. So d by dxi is a tangent vector. It's the tangent vector such that the directional derivative of f, any function f in that direction is df dxi. So the dot product of those tangent vectors in this Riemannian metric, it gives you a symmetric matrix gij of smooth functions, which I'll call g. One way to get this is if you map m to rn, there's an induced Riemannian metric. You just take the vector partial derivative of f with respect to xi, dot it with par vector partial with respect to xj, or you can write the formula there, and you get a set of gij's, an induced metric. It's just what you would think. You have a curve in space. You just measure how long a tangent vector is in, in space. So a natural question to ask, then, is if you start with capital G, can you find an F so that it's the, G is the induced Riemannian metric? It's called the isometric embedding problem. It's a system, if you have an n-dimensional manifold, of n times n plus 1 over 2 PDEs. That's the number of entries of a symmetric matrix. It's n by n. The problem's called global if m's a global manifold. It's local if you just want to do it for an open set. So, of course, potentially <coughs> there could be more Riemannian manifolds than ones that you could get in Euclidean space. But Nash showed that you could always, if you were willing to use a large enough Rn or capital N, you could always do this. And Carton and Genet showed that the local isometric embedding problem works for if you're mapping into R little n, n plus 1 over 2, in the real analytic category. So this, you'll note, is the same number of equations as unknown functions. You, number of equations is the g's, the unknown functions are the f's. In the C-infinity case, it was known for, well, classically, for n equals, for surfaces in three space if the Gaussian curvature is not zero. And if you up the co-dimension, the dimension a bit, um, Robert Greene had solved this. So I'll just mention quickly a, a theorem of Berger, Bryant, and Griffiths that for a general isometric embedding in either this magic nn plus 1 over 2 or smaller rn, then you don't have uniqueness, but you have only a finite number of constants that this such embeddings depend on. I want to focus on an existence result. So the first really unknown case is um, R is a three manifold going to into R6. That's the n n plus one over two for the C infinity case. And so Brian Griffiths and Yang were able to prove <coughs> that you could solve this as long as um, a couple of things didn't go wrong with the geometry. And to do this required some really novel ideas about PDE that bring together differential geometry and algebraic geometry, algebra and PDEs, and you get to differentiate twice. So um, this will satisfy differential geometers. Um, so remember that, and again, I'm going to have to go over this kind of lightly, but for PDEs, there's a kind of highest degree term of highest order derivatives, and the symbol you just get, so say, for example, Laplacian, the symbol of summation ci squared. If you have the wave operator, again, you just replace the highest order terms. This gets already lower order terms with this. Now, you'll notice, so because the symbol is homogeneous by definition, it's all the terms have the same degree, its zero locus actually sits in Rpn minus 1. That's called the characteristic variety. And so you'll notice for the Laplace operator, the characteristic variety is empty, whereas for the wave operator, it's not. It's a cone. So elliptic operators, in general, the ones where the characteristic variety is empty, these are the easiest ones to deal with. And the more complicated the characteristic variety is, the harder the theory of the PDE is. So exterior differential systems as I mentioned, you have a collection of one forms. It's integrable if d of the one forms is in, as it were, the ideal generated by the one forms. Then that's the Frobenius condition. But if it's, in any case, 
in the exterior differential systems collection of one forms and their derivatives. There's also a non-degeneracy condition I won't go into. An integral manifold is just an n for which the omega i's all vanish, and then it's automatic that the d omega i's vanish on m. The theory of exterior differential systems was developed by Elie Cartan, um, and it was modernized, and many people have worked on this. It's a beautiful book, which was one of the books in that earlier picture, of Brian, Churn, Gardner, Goldschmidt, and Griffiths. And systems of PDE can be reformulated as integral manifolds of exterior differential systems. So there's a whole theory of characteristics of exterior differential systems that I don't have time to explain, but I'll say a little bit. So if you take the dual of the tangent bundle to M and projectivize by replacing each of these by an RPN minus one, then associated to an exterior differential system on M, you get what's called the characteristic sheaf on this projectivized cotangent bundle, and at each P you get a characteristic variety. So it's a little ironic that I'm only mentioning sheaves in the non-algebraic geometry part, but I'm not going to uh, go much further with the characteristic sheaf. Um, <clears throat> so the beautiful part, and I'm sorry this kind of got carried over, the, for the uh, Cartagena case, um, the characteristic of variety turns out to be a hypersurface of degree n in Rpn minus one. So the one is kind of the wrong place there. So when n equals two, it's a quadric. If you have a real quadric, it would be x squared plus y squared, which has no zeros, or x squared minus y squared, which has two zeros. And exactly it's empty if the Gaussian curvature is positive and it's two points if the Gaussian curvature is negative. So the second fundamental form, if you have an embedding of M and Rn, then <clears throat> the first partials of F as vectors span the tangent space to the image, which I'll also refer to as T of M. And the normal space, well, differential geometers like to think of this as being perpendicular to the tangent space, but you can also think of it as being the quotient of tangent space of Rn by tangent space of M. And now if you have a different set of local coordinates, when you take first partials, these all behave like tensors. But when you take second partials, there's this unfortunate last term in the lower line there that's not, doesn't behave like a tensor, but it's all linear combinations of df dyr. So if you work modulo the tangent space, then it does behave like a tensor. And so this gives you the second fundamental form at each point, it's in the normal space, tensored with quadrics on the tangent space. So in other words, it's normal space valued homogeneous quadratic polynomials on T of M. So if you do this for surfaces in R3, I'm probably running out of time here, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna assume you've maybe seen surfaces in R3, but the key thing is that when the second fundamental form for surface in R3 factors into linear factors when the Gauss curvature is negative, and it doesn't when it's positive. The classical object, the second fundamental form, turns out to be the symbol for the local isometric embedding problem. That was a great insight. And so then you can say what the characteristic variety is. It's the set of all U's such that for some uh, one of these quadrics that quadric factors into u times something else. So we have a collection of quadrics coming from the second fundamental form, and at least one of these has u as a factor. That gives you the characteristic variety. This is, of course, a cone then in projectivized tangent space. Now, the last crucial thing is, so if you look at all the possible ways you can solve this, the condition for u to be a factor is that equation I wrote, this system of linear equations, summation w, mu, et cetera. The w's and the v's are variables, the q's are known, and the u's are what you want to solve for. And you'll find it's exactly the same number of equations as unknowns. There's one big determinant that vanishes, and you can see when you look at that determinant, the ui's appear in n of the columns, and so it has codimension one in degree n. So 
few things about CP. It turns out that CP is really the crucial thing in recovering the second fundamental form. I call it the one ring to rule them all. I'll give you a second to take in the contradiction in this picture. And then after that, you need estimates, it's PDE. You look at the linearized problem, and then there's an iteration scheme that lets you solve. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Are there any questions? Maybe we have one question. Okay, um, I have one question. Uh, for the Hodge conjecture, we haven't seen much progress on this conjecture. What's the expectation for any possible form of solution? Well, of course, um, I, I don't think the Clay Foundation, I think the Clay Foundation can keep that million dollars in long-term investments. I, I, I don't see any immediate prospect, but of course, I think people with any major problem, you would say that the week before it's solved. Okay. Okay, um, uh, local organizing committee uh, pre uh, prepared a present for the speaker. The Samsung Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy Tab yeah, to, ah, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not a speaker. Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, I feel creepy. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. I